Hello. 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 I cannot hear you. Ah. Ah. Now I heard you. Mm. I just heard Ooh, the rat. Look at you doing makeup. You said you might take photos, so you better take photos because, like, I shaved my armpits for this. You shaved your armpits for this. I granted my armpits won't be in the video, I mean the photos, but I felt like I was actually gonna get dressed. I have real bra on, like oh, underwire, my real. My, my headphones aren't working. I don't know why it's doing that right now. It worked yesterday. Just keep talking. Um, where's my eyelash curler? I mean, you're getting it like all out eyelash curler and everything. I'm honored. <laughs> you should be. I don't know where the eyelash curler went though. <laughs> so maybe not. Huh. Uh -huh. I even busted out like my Dior uh, uh, foundation. Ooh. Today. Fancy. My my flat iron's like, what the fuck you haven't forgotten about? <laughs> okay, I have to go. Here, so. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, I gotta get my eyelash curler. I'll be right back. All right, no worries. Are you going to tell me when you're going to take a photo? Um, I'm, I'm recording the whole, um, the whole conversation. Oh, well then you take so like I might, snapshots? Yeah, I might do like a screenshot. Okay. So if you want like a specific angle or size, we can do something at the end so I can take a screenshot of that if you want. I brought, oh, I brought Ellie. Oh. She can be in my photo. I love and take it. her eye out. Yeah. feel like a real human. I know, right? Like putting on makeup and all that stuff. Um, I wish you were closer because Kristen's divvying out avocados today. Oh, nice. Um, Chris went over to help your mom with uh, putting together her. Oh, party. she gave him some? Yeah, she gave him some. Yeah. They're amazing. Well, I can get more if you guys want to do a road trip down here. I'm literally going after this to pick them up. You want me to get you more? Uh, yeah, maybe a couple. That'd be great. Okay. Like I got... Eric is going to get them. I'm like, I'll just do it for the Long Beach crew and oh, that's perfect. it's excuses for people to get out of the house. Yeah. When you're ready to walk again, you let me know. Oh yeah, that'd be fun. Okay. okay. Look how have... beautiful you look. Hello. Hello. This is a business, this is a business arrangement. This is business meeting. This is a business meeting by Grace and Frankie. They have business meetings. They do. They, they have to just eat at the kitchen island and business happens on the table. <laughs> um, I started okay. a new show that you oh, guys what? have to watch. It is funny as fuck. It's called Shit's Creek. Oh yeah, no, I, uh, I have not seen the most recent season, but it's amazing. So the most recent season isn't on Netflix yet, Erica just mm -hmm. said. I just okay. started with season one. And okay. I'm like three, qu three quarters away through season one. Yeah. I just want to know if Catherine O'Hara, like if she just speaks and doesn't know like what accent or tone of voice is going to come out of her mouth. I know. Like her accent is so funny. You're like, Myra, what, where is she supposed to be from? It's like a fancy. But then she switches. Like yeah, she's got yeah. like 17 accents. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably like the, the, um, I guess the, the irony. Uh, it's so funny. And my, when I went to spend the night with my coworker, Kathy and her husband, Shrek in Pasadena on Halloween, cause they go like huge all out and I wear my penguin outfit. Mm -hmm. They were Moira and Johnny Rose. <gasps> Love it. And she borrowed, she borrowed like that black and white feather fascinator that Natasha wore to my birthday. Yeah. And you know, she had like 
all this chunky jewelry and she just hawked like this and and I didn't get it because I hadn't seen the show and he had his, he had his suit on yeah <laughs> oh my god um, and now I'm like oh my god I need to find those photos because now I need to look at them it's so funny oh, that's awesome but yeah that show is fucking hilarious awesome yeah I like it I'm glad you found it <sighs> well my dear should we get going? I mean, you're paying me by the minute, so it's oh, up to I'm you. Oh, I'm paying you now. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> paying me in sexual favors. Oh, what? yeah. Giggity. <laughs> There's a microphone dick coming at you. Oh, oh my God. You missed it yesterday. I don't know if Chris sent so it. So funny. Me. Oh, my God. It was he so did. funny. Okay, he good. He sent me the video of the microphone dick, oh, and I didn't God. see it until this morning, and I wrote it back. I was like, wow, I missed that last night, but that's a way to wake up. It's a nice thing to see in the first thing in the morning. Trying, we were messing around. Oh my god, we were messing around trying to figure out if like it would work, like recording and then like having my headphones and the microphone to see if it would work. And luckily, we got it to work. So, but like when he made that joke, I just like without skipping a beat, I just went for the microphone dick. (laughs) There's, I mean, why not? Why not? Well, welcome to hundredth day ish. What day is it? Quarantine. (laughs) <laughs> I think I'm the 11th I feel like I went into quarantine when my mom had her surgery I went yeah. to a con- that's the disability conference the next day mm. but like I, I went out that weekend yeah I'm on week five like today is week five I, yeah. yeah okay I think I'm that on week four right. yeah so I, I'm glad I'm glad we were able to figure out uh doing this interview unfortunately not in person I've been way more fun um, but able to, there would have been way more alcohol because I way more alcohol. don't have any alcohol right now. Yeah. Oh, you're out. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm not drinking right now because it's too early. Oh, well, are you? True. No. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, it's I only 12 30. I have bubble water, but I'm really hungover. I mean, I am I out too much last night. Mm. I am out of alcohol, but I feel okay to go back to right it now. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. That's so good. maybe I'll get some. Yeah. It's probably better though. Yeah. For this purpose. What did yeah, you guys yeah. do last night? Um, we did a couple like FaceTimes and Zooms and uh it's kind of starting at four. Cut up with seats. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shit, so. that that night we started at like four or five mm-hmm. when my iPod my iPad just died and then I could still hear <gasps> oh, you guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like I was like a bottle and a half in. I was like, you know what? This is just a sign. It's time to drink water, bed. take a Tylenol. Go to bed. It's this just time. <laughs> I'll like text Jess like, hey, tell her die. Say bye. <laughs> Good night. No hard feelings. Nope, I can hear no you guys like, Marissa, are you there? <laughs> no hard nope, feelings we're done. whatsoever. It's all oh good. Gosh. Wow. Um, okay. okay. Well, are you ready, Freddie? Hello Freddy? and welcome. <laughs> okay. We're ready. So uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my Cancer Story podcast. Very first one. Woo! Yay! First interview. Finally popping my cherry. Um, Ooh, so, yeah, I'm so talking. honored to be have, the cherry popper. You are the cherry popper. <laughs> so, the, um, way, the way this is going to go, and I like oh, it. Oh, geez. I know. I'm going to have to put the explicit for this one. It's going to be great. Uh, so for my very first interview, I have here with with you, uh, my very, very good friend, Marissa Gonzalez. Um, she's one of my very first friends when I moved to Long Beach. And um, we, we were introduced by an acquaintance and became instant friends and roommates, uh, lived together for about two years. And uh, we're both lovers of wine. And I think that's what we bonded over when I interviewed to be your roommate. So um, got to know her really well over the past eight years. And she has a really unique story. Uh, really unique cancer story uh, that I initially like instantly thought of you when like I was thinking about who I wanted to interview when you were top of the list very first interview I wanted to do Um, and Marissa has this rare cancer story and I'll I'll let her get more into it with you Um, it's a called bilateral retinoblastoma so I'll let you take it from here what the fuck (laughs) is bilateral retinoblastoma uh well that's a really good question so <laughs> thank you so much I'm honored to be your very Yay. first guest and Jess is thank one of my dearest nearest <laughs> nearest and dearest 
friends, um, along with her husband, Chris, um, just really important people in my life. And Jess actually went to Vegas with me to celebrate 25 years being cancer free a couple of years ago. So yeah. it's been a real um, supporter of, of my cancer journey, journey. And, you know, it's unfortunate that now I'm a supporter of her cancer journey. True. That's all I, good. We're doing great. I'm not even drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your body's I'm like, what the hell? A <laughs> <laughs> uh, supporter of her cancer journey. So as she mentioned, the cancer that I have is called bilateral retinoblastoma. The bilateral refers to um, both sides of the body. And retinoblastoma is a cancer of the retina. And the way that it presents is a white glow, which is called a leucrocoria. So my mother likens it to looking into a cat's eye and you kind of can almost look through the cat's eye and the opaqueness of the eye is actually the tumor. And I was diagnosed in 1982 and my mom just saw this kind of glow in the eye and thought, this really, I don't know, this isn't right took me to a doctor. That doctor said, you're being an overprotective parent. And it was around the holidays and Thanksgiving and Christmas and so busy with a baby around the holidays, but mm -hmm. it just kept nagging her. You know, I just don't feel like this is right. Just mm -hmm. a mother's intuition. I know the doctor said nothing's wrong, but I need to I need to get a second opinion. So in January of 1982, she took me um, to a pediatric ophthalmologist in Long Beach, California, named uh, Dr. Teresa Rosales. And I didn't know I was that. Immediately, huh? <laughs> I said I didn't know that. <laughs> I was immediately taken. Uh, Dr. Rosales said we need to have her in the operating room tomorrow. Um, we need to to dilate the eye and, and have the ability to really look into it. And the next day it was confirmed that I had bilateral retinoblastoma. So that means that the tumors were in both of the retinas and there is a form uh, of unilateral retinoblastoma, which means it's only in one eye. Mm -hmm. And we did radiation treatment for a month um, in Orange County in March of 1982. So I was diagnosed in January. We did a month of radiation and my mom kind of just scoured the country um, to figure out. We started doing electrotherapy, um, craniosacral therapy. We saw a religious healer in Boston. Um, anything she likes to say, if I could have taken her to a witch doctor on Mount Kenya, I would. Um, <laughs> And so with those kind of alternative therapies that weren't necessarily very accepted in the early 80s, and also you have to remember this is pre-internet, so mm -hmm. you can't just look something up. Mm -hmm. um, we also went to New York for a second opinion. And in July of 82, seven months after diagnosis, it was confirmed that the left eye was going to have to be enucleated, which means removed because the cancer was spreading so rapidly and the fear was it would hit the optic nerve and once it hits the optic nerve it's kind of the gateway to the brain and then it's just not uh not going to be a happy ending no. <laughs> so uh in late july at 23 months old i had my eye removed and my mom said that you know of course it was the hardest day of her life uh, medically it's not that difficult of an actual procedure i was up running around the very next day as if Nothing had happened, but obviously the emotional and physical toll uh, mm -hmm. it takes on a parent is <laughs> much harder yeah. to watch. Um, it's been a difficult journey having monocular vision, um, but the cancer continued to grow in the right eye for another five years. So we continued to go back and forth between Long Beach, California and uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York. And the tumors were just very, very stubborn. They did not want to stop growing. Uh, I believe my last tumor was in 1987. And then we continued exams under anesthesia for another five years because of um, how aggressive my tumors had been just to make sure that there weren't any recurrences. So in 92, at age 12, I was declared in remission. And at that point, I had 50 surgeries, five zero, um, oh for all, all for cancer. Just a um, baby and had 50 surgeries. A baby. <laughs> and, oh you know, 
the as psychosocial emotional impact as those because at 12 you remember a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> um because of the radiation i started to develop a cataract in the right eye the seeing eye which was removed at age 20 my junior year of college because it was causing me to go blind and so from 12 to 20 i think i only had one surgery which was wisdom teeth which obviously <laughs> didn't have much to do with the, um, completely unrelated <laughs> cancer. oh i didn't have an eyelid surgery at 18. so i went like six years with with only having one cancer related surgery and wow. then that stopped <laughs> yeah at age 22, right after graduating from college, I had um, significant bone loss in my temples and upper cheeks and eyelid area from the radiation and had a facial reconstruction surgery, a bone reconstruction that went um, unfortunately very sideways and caused me to be in immense pain that I still deal with today, wow. um, caused us to have to do other surgeries to release like muscles, cut part of my jaw out so that I could move my head again. That doctor has since retired, so I won't put him on blast because of what he did to me. Yeah. Um, and then I did go a while without surgery. And in the late, like probably 2007, eight, I started really looking into more facial reconstruction mm -hmm. and have had probably 12 to 15 facial reconstructive surgeries over the last probably 15 years, combination of two different surgeons in Los Angeles and a surgeon in New York. Um, and for the majority of those surgeries were very successful. It's very hard to do surgery on irradiated tissue muscles. Um, the interior of my eye socket was reconstructed twice uh, because of all of the radiation damage. And, you know, my face looks very different. I do very much <laughs> like and appreciate the way that my bone structure appears now, uh, as opposed to how it had been for many, many years of my life. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, in 2018, I had an optic nerve stroke in my right eye, which left me legally blind in my one seeing eye. I do have what I personally think is about 20% vision. It's okay. 20 over 400 on a reading chart, which is way beyond blind, but I don't care what the chart says. I care what I can do and I can yeah, see. So I, can see. I can drive, I can't, you know, I can read print that is like four inches tall and a big fat Sharpie. Um, yeah. And so over the last 20 months, my cancer story has taken a very different turn because I've been learning how to live as a 39 year old legally blind woman. Yeah. woman um right. who can't get herself to work who can you know yeah walk the dog by herself in the sunlight mm -hmm. but basically having every freedom that i had before this kind of taken away with no notice and no warning so it's been a long 20 months um you know i'd like to say oh this is just part of my journey but it's just a real fucked up part of my journey, let me tell <laughs> yeah. you. It Same is least, obviously yeah. part of my journey, but, um, you know, you're not going to hear me be like, oh, you know, this happens for a reason. I don't know what the reason is, but it happened. Um, so I am kind of trying now to help other people in similar situations. Uh -huh. um, I'm sure we'll talk about the charity work yeah. that I do as well. Yeah. The, the one thing, like, uh, that is especially one of the first things I remember uh, about you is we, I think we we're going on a walk, like I had just moved in and I was just so impressed because I didn't, I didn't realize that you ha had only one eye. Like it didn't even, <laughs> I don't know. It just didn't occur to me that I was like, oh, man, whatever. And, um, but like, you you starting to tell me your cancer story then and how uh, not sorry you didn't feel sorry for yourself and like you just had like this beautiful outlook on life and not that everything happens for a reason but you took a really crappy situation like you and your mom had to deal with your whole life and you just like made it into this beautiful outlook and what you share with people and you know all, all like the fun things you do and volunteering and we'll be getting into your um 
getting into your uh, the retinoblastoma charity that you you work for. And, you know, just like your attitude and outlook on life, which is so, um, so bright, you know, and um, you kind of take, take no prisoners and the the way that, (laughs) the way that you just influence other people, it's, it's, you spreaded light instead of darkness. And that was one of the very first things that I noticed about you. And I just, I loved that because, you know, like a lot of people who go through terrible situations, whether it's cancer, an accident, losing vision in her other eye, like you you still manage to come out the other side and still be you and still spread like that good positive energy. So, you know, that's, I I don't know if I ever told you that, but I I just thought that was like one of the most amazing things. Well, thank you. I, I guess I never really felt like there was a point in feeling sorry for myself. Um, and you know, I definitely have bad days and especially in the last 20 months since losing the vision, you know, I've gone through every stage of grief and anger and yeah. gone into the why me and the, you know, yeah. all of those things. But I guess, you know, my mom didn't really treat me much differently than if I had two eyes. I mean, yeah. going to school and when you're in elementary school and junior high, kids can be real dicks. It's um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was definitely treated differently and bullied and, and I was very shy. People don't believe that I was just a shy child until I probably hit high school. I was very quiet That's socially. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable because it's like, <laughs> it's in a complete 180 now. It's, yeah it's hard to believe but uh yeah I think when I hit high school I just found you know this great group of friends and I found mm-hmm. ice skating um which just side note is Jess's favorite sport <laughs> in the whole world um oh, I started man. taking ice skating lessons <laughs> if you're watching video I'm, I'm vigorously shaking my head if you can't see me <laughs> her favorite athlete is Michelle Kwan oh, actually man. um oh she's great <laughs> <laughs> so I I in middle school, you know, found a sport that I really liked and found a community. And I think that really kind of became the the beginning of me to actually turning into me yeah. and letting my loudness come through and my personality. And yeah. no one cared about my eye. No one cared that I looked different. It just, that was the first real, I'd say like, yeah, that's awesome. Like in into the state, awesome. you know, have like that group of friends from high school, which is like unheard of these days. I do. Your I, high school friends are the best. Like I do. I have know them, and they're so great. Oh, hi! Awkward silence. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, shout out to kind of going shout back out to, to Los your first diagnosis. What? Like your your mom not taking no for an answer. Like how. Um, I guess like her thought process, like how, how did this whole process go for her? And I, I hope to have her on, on this podcast. Oh, she will. Her yeah. Approach. She'll be, but like for she um going from not taking no to an answer and then like how it just like all opened up and like how the shit hit the fan and like how, how did she, you know, being a single mother, like how did she, um I guess, deal with it and, and, you know, like, take care of you and take care of herself. Yeah. And you have to remember like 1982 is just, there's no, I mean, she tells the story of, you know, my doctors here in California would say, okay, you need to go to New York tomorrow and they need to see her in New York and get their advice and expertise. And she's like, there was no internet. There was no Expedia. She's like, we packed a bag. Your grandma drove us to LAX we got, you know, we went into the continental terminal Mm -hmm. and I just had a checkbook and I said, I need two tickets on the next flight to New York or New Jersey. And I wrote a check for whatever the price was, um, which is, you know, we don't think about that now because we can, we can book book a flight flight. 10 minutes from our, our phone, you know, or, um, so yeah, she really, took no prisoners, as you said. Um, my father had been um, in my life up until that point. And when I was diagnosed, you know, he kind of took a step back and just 
let my mom know that she was going to be taking this on mostly by herself. Um, mm -hmm. And she said, you know, in a way that was a blessing because she didn't need to run decisions by anybody else. And she could just make the decisions that she felt were best and making a decision like, oh, should I remove my kid's eye tomorrow? You know, those aren't like, should I get chocolate or vanilla? I, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little different. A little different. Yeah. Um, so while the unfortunate part of that was that, you know, I didn't have a father figure really in my life. Um, my mom was able to just do do her thing and she was uh, in the process of getting a master's degree in anthropology so she had access to the library um, at Cal State Long Beach so she could look up microfiche things and <laughs> like encyclopedias and had access to oh you know our version of the internet yeah but could do, could do more research than just a normal person could yeah. so you know I'm sure she second-guessed herself many times um, the doctor basically didn't really give her a choice when it came down to removing yeah. the eye um, because it would have endangered my life and, mm -hmm. and likely would have killed me once the cancer got to the brain. Yeah. Um, and it speaks to, you know, just how much technology and medicine has come in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, we don't even really treat with radiation for this disease yeah. anymore radiation because it is, is so damaging. Oh. Yeah. And I never had chemotherapy, but that is how we treat um, the majority of our patients now. Okay. So yeah, she just like, you know, I love the phrase had no fucks to give. Um, I'm going to save my kid and whatever I have to do. However, she went about $25,000 into debt, racking up medical debt, medical bills, lights, and it didn't matter. She just, yeah. you know, was able to borrow some money from different friends that she ultimately paid every penny back. And luckily she had a really good friend in New York. So every time we were in New York, we had a free place to stay. Yeah. And she just did what she did. You just go into mom warrior mode. Yeah. Your mom's such a badass. My mom is a badass. <laughs> the best. And it's just crazy. Like you're saying back in 82, like there wasn't like Google. You couldn't Google it. Like, yeah, there was no Google. Eye? There was no cell phone either. Yeah, it like was... what's in my kid's eye? Why is it like a cat eye? That's weird. Yeah, but, now uh, we have so many, um, yeah. you know, they're, they're, uh, someone I work with is developing an app for Luke or Coria. Um, wow. A lot of what we try to really suggest to people is they turn off the, the red eye reduction on cameras because a lot of times you can miss the leukocoria a lot of times you can diagnose it and see it in photos and many kids oh. have been diagnosed simply by uh parents taking a picture and then later looking through your phone and being like hmm I, that, something doesn't look right uh we've definitely had people who have posted photos of their kids or their friends kids or their nieces or nephews and someone has seen them and and contacted that person and said you know what this doesn't look right it looks like there's a glow in the eye you should get your kid checked out. We definitely have stories of some random person on Facebook who's friends of a friend of a friend saw the glow in my child's eye and that's how it was diagnosed. Um, a lot of my generation now has done genetic testing um, because that is readily available for survivors and it can be genetic. Um, it can be a spontaneous mutation as well. So there are hereditary types of retinoblastoma and non-hereditary types. So I had my genetics done in 2008 uh, through, uh, Los An or through Children's Hospital Los Angeles. So we were able to isolate where in my DNA chain the abnormality was. And then if I chose to have biological children, that could help. Um, and I do have the hereditary type. So that could help doctors and researchers determine whether if I did IVF, my egg, the, the embryo had it, um, wow. or diagnose, you know, tumors in the womb and, and so take crazy. the right course of action depending on, you know, where in the pregnancy. And then if nothing developed, you know, the baby would then start getting treated yeah. at one, two, three days old so that they can proactively look for those tumors because, you know, they would know where to look. And they could also genetically test the child to see if the same strain was carried. 
That's incredible. Science is so... <laughs> science is, yeah. Science is um, mine, mine was a spontaneous mutation, though. It was a what? Mine, we believe, was a spontaneous mutation. Spontaneous. Okay. So. And yours was hereditary. Or hereditary. Mine is, yeah. yes. Okay. So if I, if I were to have a child, there'd be a 50% chance that that child would have. Oh, wow. That's a uh, disease. It is. So I've personally, you know, I made the decision right then and there in the geneticist's office in 2008 that mm. I didn't want to take those uh, that those odds were just way too high for me. I didn't want to go down this road again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of being very active in this community is, is learning that just because that's my decision, it's not everyone's decision. And it's important to respect, you know, people making the decision that's best for them and for their family. I mean, and for me, what's best kind of for me is not to, yeah. to, to do, to have a biological child. Um, and that's just my own. I'm not preaching that to anyone that is no. simply Marissa's plan in life. <laughs> yeah, no, then that's, and that's fair. It's everybody has, it has a choice, you know, whether or not they have a genetic mutation. Yeah. Um, that's 50% 50 chance. That's, that's incredible. Um, I know it, it can't be easy to always accept people's decisions, especially with people who are it, where it is hereditary um, and knowing mm -hmm. that they might give it on to their child. Um, that's got to be tough mm -hmm. to, to accept and to not judge because like we're constantly judging like throughout life, like, and just to be able to live and let live, like this is this individual's choice. They want to have their own children. I can, I can accept yeah. that. It um, took me a while to, yeah. to get, and now you know, especially doing charity work. It's, I, I am not the doctor. I am not, I don't tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. I, I have gotten to a place where I really am able to respect everybody's own personal decisions. And at the same time, I hope that they respect mine. Yeah, absolutely. That's all you can hope for. Um, speaking of like, let's, let's just get right, right into the charity. It's a world eye cancer hope organization. Can it you is. A yes. Bit more about that. So it was founded Absolutely. It was founded as Daisy's Eye Cancer um, Fund. And about five or six years ago, we changed the name to World Eye Cancer Hope. So it was a little bit more descriptive. I mean, it doesn't have retinoblastoma in the title. Um, but it was, it was initially founded um, by Abby White, who lives in England, um, who is a bilateral retinoblastoma survivor. Her father also is a survivor. And she has done incredible work um, with patients, survivors, families around the world. Right now, she's being inundated daily with questions about COVID and cancer and retinoblastoma. And so she had been helping a family um, from Botswana who had a little girl named Rati. And she had retinoblastoma and their family did not have the means to get to a treatment center. And so another family whose child had retinoblastoma, the child's name was Daisy, <laughs> hence the name Daisy's Eye Cancer Fund. And they funded her treatment in Toronto at Sick Kids Hospital. Um, unfortunately, she did pass away um, a couple months later. And that was how the charity began. So it just began very small. Um, we have now branches in Canada um, with our team running out of Sick Kids Toronto. Um, we have a U.S. branch and a U.K. branch and a um, Kenyan branch. And we do um, a lot of work in Eldoret, Kenya, um, okay. because they're, you know, it, it's such a different story being in a developing nation versus being in the United States. The treatment, the availability, the finances, everything is, is so different. So it's been really interesting to get a glimpse of how different countries treat retinoblastoma. Mm -hmm. And so we founded the U.S. branch about, say, seven or eight years ago. And so I was a founding board member and have been the president of the U.S. chapter for about three years now. Um, one of the coolest things that I've done with the charity is plan and execute the One Retinoblastoma World Conference in Washington, D.C. So it takes place every approximately two years. And I was the event co-chair along with Dr. Jesse Berry out of Children's Hospital Los Angeles, who was the medical, um, medical expert, the scientific programming lead. And she lined up various doctors and physicians, medical experts um, from around the world. And then I did 
the family day portion and all of the event logistics along with one of our other board members, Kristen Small, who was on the ground running everything, <laughs> um, who, who, who's on our board as well. And it's been so interesting getting to know people from all over the world. I mean, I, I literally have contacts on every continent except Antarctica, um, <laughs> of doctors and physicians, child life specialists. And, you know, when I was a teenager and in college and right after college, I did not talk about cancer. I just, I don't even know how old I was when I figured out the name of my cancer. It was just one of the ways my mom dealt with it. It's like, we didn't talk about it. It was not, there was no open dialogue about surgery, about cancer, about any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just never dealt with it really. And we didn't have child life specialists. We didn't have Facebook groups. We didn't have ways to interact with other families back then. And, and so to see how amazing the resources are now and, you know, to be good friends with a child life specialist, Morgan, who um, lives in Toronto, but works all over the world and to see the amazing work and how impactful and how different a child's experience can be if they have medical play and they are allowed, you know, they have an opportunity to have an open dialogue, even babies that, that can't dialogue with you. Um, so it took me until kind of my mid twenties to even be open to finding out more about retinoblastoma. So I mentioned to my ocularist, Steve Haddad, um, an ocularist is someone that makes prosthetic eyes. And I said, you know, I know you're on the board of Retinoblastoma International. I'm interested in getting involved. <laughs> Very shaky ground here. Um, that organization um, wasn't too active, but he put me in touch with a woman who ultimately put me in touch with Abby White in England. And Abby was here in Los Angeles on a visit. So we went out to lunch and told me about the U.S. chapter. And I signed on and kind of just never looked back. And it really has been a huge growth for me emotionally, mentally, you know, going from never talking about cancer to I literally talk about cancer every day and I, I'm not angry when I talk about it, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm working with our Canada team right now. We're, we're doing the one retinoblastoma world virtually, unfortunately, because of coronavirus. Yeah. Um, you know, but I'm emailing about retinoblastoma, about this stuff all the time. It's mm -hmm. just a normal topic of conversation and yeah. the people I've been able to meet around the world right here in Southern California, in Canada, in Australia, um, that are, these people are literally saving babies' lives. I mean, I just talked to, to Dr. Barry last night um, to see how they're doing at CHLA and catch up with her. So they've become lifelong friends. I mean, I threw her baby shower. Yeah. Oh <laughs> and God. so they're just such important people in my life. And if we can help impact one child, help one child get diagnosed. I mean, my college roommate's baby was diagnosed because of me, because so of all of the um, photos and information I put on Facebook and, yeah. and she would have had no reason to think her child would have this cancer. But when she looked at pictures and she looked at his eyes, she said, I, I have seen this before. And because of the awareness that we do, she knew I better get this baby in. She called me. I was there in the hospital. I was like, I knew every step to take. I knew every doctor to call here in Los Angeles. And we were in two days later and I was sitting there when the baby was diagnosed. Wow. That's... But had she not known me or had she not seen any awareness campaigns? Yeah. Who knows how long it would have been. So and he's like, doing very, very well because okay. she was educated I mean, and she's a very and well educated early on, woman. I imagine, so. Yeah. I imagine she caught it fairly early. She caught it very early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's incredible. It's just like what are the odds? Like what are the um the odds? We shared for... a freaking bunk bed in college. What are the odds? I did ask I asked um one of my friends in Canada, Dr. Galley, I was like, what are the odds? And she said, Yeah, like one in a million, basically. <laughs> That's, it's crazy. It's crazy. What, you just never know. In general, um, for, uh, well, retinoblastoma or bilateral retinoblastoma, what are, what are the odds of, um, like one in what? For, like, it's about getting it. We, in the United States, we have about 
350 new cases a year. I might be off by, by 20 or 30, but okay. it's, that's a very small percentage, yeah. um, given how many, I don't know how many children there are in the United States, <laughs> but, um, it, my friend Sandra, who works in Australia, I mean, she, she, she's in Melbourne and she has, you know, eight, nine, 10 cases a year at Children's Los Angeles. We have that like sometimes in a week. Um, obviously like population density and yeah, it plays a big difference. But yes, in the United States, it's around 350 new diagnoses per year. Wow. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, that's, it's pretty small. small. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty small. And we have different hubs uh, in the United States of different centers, depending where you are geographically that, you know, not every hospital deals with this, this because they don't have, there's not a need to have an ophthalmologist at every hospital that knows how to treat this. So yeah. we have different centers across the United States, um, CHLA, we have centers in New York, in Boston, um, in Texas, uh, one up in Oregon, San Francisco. Mm. So. Wow. That's, that's insane. Now Depending you where you live, yeah. Yeah. Well, you think about like the big hubs, like you said, like the, the yeah. higher population areas, of course. Um, you mentioned um, an eye prosthetist. Can you tell me more about, <laughs> about that and yes. about all the eyes that you've had through your life? And, and oh, I can go yeah. get some if you want. Um, <laughs> so a prosthetic eye is, um, it, it basically, once you remove an, the eye, the inside of your eye socket, it kind of looks to me like the inside of your cheek, kind of just the fleshy, you know, you've seen me without yeah. an eye. I've gone probably in total two years where I've not been able to wear an eye. So I've worn an eye patch, but when I'm at home, I just don't. Oh, probably even more actually, maybe three years um, in my life where there hasn't been an eye in there. And so an, uh, an ocu ocular Prostitute. <laughs> something prostitute. I'm going to say prostitute. <laughs> Inocular prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> so in that makes I'm picking up what you're putting down. Prosthetics <laughs> eyes. Um, I've been so fortunate to have um, ocular prosthetics here in Los Angeles, which I've been going to, gosh, sorry, Steve, if you're listening to this for like 20 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stephen Haddad um, has this wonderful company that he's just such a caring, caring human being. His daughter, Sarah has actually followed in his footsteps and, oh, wow. and one of, um, the staff there, Bev, her daughter actually followed in her mom's footsteps too. So they make prosthetic eyes out of plaster of Paris and plastic. And I'm not exactly sure mm -hmm. the correct way to describe it, but it's like a lab and it's truly, you're an artist because you're painting the iris and painting the veins on the eye and, and literally painting it to make it look exactly like the other eye, which so many people, as you alluded to, don't even know that it's a prosthetic eye. Yeah. That's due a lot in part to the person that makes it and also to all the different surgeries that I've had. Mm -hmm. The people that haven't had radiation and haven't had to have facial surgery, you would never know. Some people can have pegs in the back of the eye, uh, the prosthetic eye that can attach to the muscles so that it actually oh, moves. It can move. Wow. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, I'm not a candidate for that. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, that's a large part of, of your life when you're a child because you're growing so much. So you have to have eyes made more frequently, um, a prosthetic eye in a, an adult whose socket isn't changing will last about four to five years. Okay. Um, and then you go in for a polish about every six months. It's like taking it to the car wash to take it out. They take it back to the lab, they buff it, they scrub it, they shampoo it, and it's ready to go. <laughs> um, a lot of people can take their own eye out with like a little mm -hmm. baby plunger mm -hmm. and they can wash it themselves. They can, you know, put so put solution on it. Um, I have a socket that's incredibly difficult. I have to like take a bike when I go and oh just see Steve because it's so painful and it is a fight. It's like a wrestling match. So, so <laughs> um, take out and put in? Taking is it, out just, is easy. Okay, Putting okay, it in is in. very, because of all the radiation and the bone damage. So it's like, 
Steve and I just get ready to go into battle. <laughs> um, oh it's a lot easier now that I'm an adult and I can just yeah. sit there than it is when you're a child. But oh man, I used to hate going there. Now I love going there because yeah. I just love everyone in the office. And um, it's, you know, total change from 20 years ago when I would just cry and scream. And now I'm like, oh yeah, I'm here. I see all my peeps. <laughs> and I just, I know the whole staff and everyone's so great. But it is a challenging experience for children. Um, yeah. You know, it's painful and you, you're in there and you're in the waiting room and you can hear kids crying and it's like, Oh God, flashback. Like, oh, yeah. Don't have a panic attack, please. Yeah. PTSD yeah. right there. I can oh, keep the PTSD. It's terrible. But I actually yeah. have um, an elephant who, who is here yeah, with me. Let's see Ellie. This is Ellie the elephant. Yay. And she is made in Germany and she's free for any child that um, has a removed eye it doesn't have to be from retinoblastoma. There's a lot of other diseases and reasons that children lose eyes. And her eye actually, her left eye like mine is the prosthetic and you can take it out. Oh my gosh. Oh, can you hold it up a little bit higher? Yeah. Oh my God. She's adorable. She's so cute. Her little name, she Ellie, is, so cute. Ellie is on the bottom um, of her, of her foot. And so then you can put it back in kind of like me. It's, her eye is not the easiest to get in, but um, <laughs> they make these in Germany. Um, my friend Monica works for a company that makes them, and, and they'll send them anywhere around the world for free if you send an email and let them know that your child or your adult, I mean, yeah. but something like this like is so good for hospitals to have and doctors to have, and, and my ocularist has one. Um, what a great program struggling getting her eyeball back and so that the kids can play with her and they can see what's going to happen. Okay. This is how this is going to go. I made a video of her, of, of Ellie going and getting her eye taken out and getting her eye polished and everything. So um, and you know, sitting in the chair, I need to find that video. I mean, that, but I think it's a great cool. toy. Yeah. That's so smart. And, I, the evolution of the education of it um, and then the resources and the sense of community. I just, I imagine mm -hmm. it's grown so much in the past. It's grown so much. There wasn't anything in 40 years, you know, we had a panel in our, at our Washington DC conference in 2017 that, um, we had a parent panel and my mom sat on it, which shocked <laughs> me because my mom, you know, has come so far in her ability to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, to talk about the experience. One thing that we both have done a lot of is, is go to therapy, which I think is therapy is I'm the biggest proponent of, of mental health and therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really helped a ton and it's helped her as well. So she, you know, she spoke about how she didn't know any other parents. Mm -hmm. She didn't have anyone to lean on. Um, and now we have in Southern California, we have, um, an annual family day. And I think this last August when we had it, there were like 65 people there and there were parents, there were kids. We had face painter. It was a super fun day. The kids didn't necessarily know, Oh, I'm hanging out with other kids that have my cancer. Cause that's not what it was about. It was just about building community. Mm -hmm. And so my mom's there talking to, you know, parents of like a seven month old who were just diagnosed, but then there's also adult survivors. And that just was not an option in the eighties. Yeah. So yes, to see how far, that's probably the thing I'm most proud of is just to see how far people have come and, and getting to know so much about child life specialists and their role, mm -hmm. um, in children's lives and how impactful that is and how much better off mm -hmm. children are now with those resources. Cause yeah, the PTSD is up. Bitch, let me tell yeah, you, I still absolutely. have massive PTSD, but yeah, I can imagine. I can't wear like an oxygen mask, like the just <gasps> the, the like memory of the gas coming in. I mean, I I remember being like five and ripping oh, from like getting anesthesia the mask for surgeries. Off. Yes. Oh, just, you know those like oxygen bars yeah, in the yeah, mall yeah, yeah. where they're like, can get it just like yeah. if it, yeah, oxygen blowing in my face is an instant panic attack because it reminds me of the, the anesthesia gas being shoved at my nose. Oh my God. Yeah. I can, I can imagine that. that would and I couldn't drink life. apple juice for years. Oh my God. I still can't even drink apple juice. Cause that's what they'd give you after surgery, but oh, really? you know, 
I overcame by being able to drink apple martinis. So congratulations. That's, that's you know, good. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> move on sometime, right? All in all, um, I don't know if you covered it before. I know you like kind of like went through the surgeries. The total, how many surgeries for for cancer and the after effects have you had? So by my count, seventy five. And I think like maybe two or three of those weren't cancer related, like the wisdom teeth. Oh, okay. Uh, so I just say seventy five because you know I'm counting the wisdom teeth in there. But um, some of the surgeries have been awake, not under general anesthesia. I had um, a ptosis surgery, which is basically cauterizing the muscles in your eyelid to help the eyelid stand up and be more open. That one I did awake because they needed me to sit up, open my eye, close my eye open. You know, um, I mean, it was in a hospital and smelling your flesh burning. I was going to say like oh, half an inch away from that. your nose. Ooh. It's pretty nasty. It smells <laughs> pretty awful. Um, and they kept refusing to give me more drugs. And I wrote a nasty letter to that hospital. <laughs> I, <went too. laughs> I was like, guys, I need more drugs. I need more drugs. Yeah. Um, and I've had, yeah, I've had a couple like in the OR awake. Um, I had liposuction awake, which was really not fun because um, one of the things we've done a number of times now in New York and Los Angeles is utilize stem cells, adipose stem cells, which means your own stem cells as opposed to embryonic. Um, so they take the way to get stem cells is via liposuction. So they do liposuction and then they do a, pro a process called centrifuging where they separate the fat and the blood and the stem cells mm -hmm. and then just get a huge, you know, millions and millions of, of isolated stem cells and mix some of it with um, platelet rich plasma and put a little bit of fat back in and then use it as an injectable, such as like you'd think of Botox or something, but or you're like utilizing or yeah, and stuff like that. You're okay. utilizing your own body fluid. So it's no foreign objects going in because um, with radiation, it's somewhat dangerous to put foreign objects um, like fillers into that area. Gotcha. So we've done a lot of, of, stem cell transplants, about five of them. And yeah, I never actually knew the process of liposuction. So I did one of those in completely awake with one Valium. Oh. And I really didn't know what liposuction was. <laughs> and I, I was in New York, I at, at NYU, I was in for a rude awakening. The anesthesia didn't take, like the local didn't take on my right side. So I had full lipo, like, Oh my no God. anesthesia. I it see looks this needle. Really oh, I see this needle. I've never seen it. And my friend was like, so "Haven't awesome. you watched E? Haven't you watched like Botched and all those those shows like that?" And I was like, "No, yeah. no, I hadn't. I literally thought that they sliced you open like a couple inches, mm -hmm. and then they scooped fat out, and then they sewed you back up." I was like, like, "Scalpel, <laughs> scalpel, like slicing me open. No big deal. I can handle so much pain. I am like." A, pain tolerance that's so yeah. high and then I see this giant ass like 15 inch needle and this vacuum <laughs> cleaner like <laughs> and I was like I was like at one point and you're you're basically like taped down like your arms are like oh stigmata God. style and so you cannot move and they put on you know my music for my iPod and they're talking me through and at one point the nurse just comes over and she like she kind of cradles my head and she just kisses my head and she's like, you just look like you need a hug. And I'm like, yeah, because I have no, and I, I just, it was awful. So then they, they, they took that fat and centrifuged it and then injected it all around my temples and cheeks completely awake. I mean, talk about PTSD. One oh Valium. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. Um, so yeah, I've had a lot of surgeries awake and a lot of in-office procedures that I, I, count in that number of 75. But yeah, don't ever get lipo awake, guys. And upper thigh lipo <laughs> is just... Uh, yeah. Veteran advice. But it's an added there. bonus. I, I, got extra, I got extra fat like hey, why not? put into the ladies because, you know, the fat was going to be thrown away. And well, I yeah, just, just... Add them on. Heck yeah. Add them on. I did Make like a little chin good. tuck one time. You know. A little, little perk right there. No vanity. <laughs> Oh man. So, okay. So since, uh, 
you have one eye and now that one's more at like you say about 20% of vision. What kind mm -hmm. of tools do you have to assist you like to overcome these hurdles? Um, like with work, with going out with, uh, just like staying mm -hmm. at home, watching TV or reading a book or you know, what kind of tools do you use for, for the vision? Uh, I utilize the pharmacy a lot. You what? <laughs> I, I utilize the pharmacy. That's my main <laughs> tool is drugs. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm actually just on one antidepressant a day, which is pretty That's surprising. Fantastic. Um, I utilize in Southern California, we have the Braille Institute and there are six different centers. I go to the one in Anaheim and I have this wonderful, wonderful teacher named Hugo and I do weekly and before Corona bi-weekly, um, adaptive technology training. So when this all first started, I went to the Braille Institute, met, um, met with them. They assessed, you know, the level of services. I went to some classes, group classes, and just kind of determined that one-on-one -on -one training would, would be better for my unique situation. Mm -hmm. I also utilized the Department of Rehabilitation. Um, California has a program to keep you employed um, and or help you Oh, no. find employable. So I, had, I was so fortunate that my employer, the University of Southern California School of Dramatic Arts, fight on, um, was so understanding. I've, I've been out on disability, like, I don't know, 10 times, <laughs> so many times with surgeries. So, you know, obviously this is a very extended disability. So I was able to take nine months completely off of work, take FMLA, utilize my short-term disability insurance, work with the Department of Rehab. They were able to buy me um, a lot of tools, uh, screen reader tools. Um, there's a program called JAWS, like the shark, <laughs> J-A-W-S, and, and it's installed on uh, my, my laptop, and USC bought it for me for work, and it basically reads everything to you, memorize commands for everything. You want to get into your email, you need to know the code, the, the shortcut key to get into your email. Once you're in your email, you want to start a new email. You got to do the code as opposed to just moving the mouse to the new button and clicking new email. So it is, yeah. it's literally like a learning Russian. Yeah, it is so, it's such a huge language. learning curve. I mean, yeah. it is a new language and it is frustrating as heck. It's yeah. so frustrating. Um, I've been doing JAWS training for a year before, right when Corona hit was a year that I've been training with Hugo and I now feel like a whiz on email. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've been doing Excel and word training and I'm working part-time and USC and my supervisor and our Dean have, have just been so incredibly supportive. There's so much bad press about USC in the last couple of years, but the way that Dramatic Arts is, has handled a disabled employee has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and so I go to work, well, I was going to work two to three days a week. Yeah, now I'm working from home because I do yeah. have all this accessible technology. The Department of Rehabilitation also bought me a really giant um, screen reader so I can put a piece of paper underneath it. It takes a picture and it reads it out loud. Um, I have various magnifiers. I have lots of different magnifiers. I have um, a device that you like, looks like a pen and you point it at text and, and take a picture and it has artificial intelligence in it. So it reads the photo. So it could be anything from like a headline in a newspaper, or you could read an entire page of a book text. I also utilize through the Braille Institute, um, an app called Bard Mobile. And it is the Library of Congress library, basically. And so it's free for physically handicapped and, and visually impaired folks. And there's also Braille options. I have not learned actual Braille, like mm -hmm. utilizing um, Braille, but, and I don't plan to because technology is so, so good. And I have all these adaptive technology tools on my phone. I have an app called Iro, which is amazing. You call them and they access your camera. They're set up to access my laptop and they can read things. I usually use them like, can you tell me if this yogurt is expired? Or can you tell me if this <laughs> cheese is that. melty? That's so cool. <laughs> things like that. The, that one like? I pay for. You know what? It yeah. is like, it is amazing. And it's like 23 bucks a month. But if your conversation is less 
and that's for 30 minutes. But if your conversation is less than five minutes, it's free. And if you're on your laptop and you need help using basically anything on the computer that JAWS, the screen reader, mm -hmm. does, that's free too. Wow. It's and the people are amazing. There are free versions called Be My Eyes, but I just utilize the paid subscription. Mm -hmm. I also utilize my roommate a lot. <laughs> um, well, DT is very who, helpful. <laughs> DT is very helpful. Um, it's been hard to ask for a lot of help. I do have a um, personal assistant, a couple different ones that kind mm -hmm. of um, one moved away to college, but she uh, would come over like once a couple of times a month and help me do paperwork and taxes. And then um, her cousin came over and helped me. And one of my student workers from USC helps me a lot on the phone. You know, I pay them a small amount, um, yeah. but it's just so helpful to not have to, to ask people. And then, um, you know, when people are over, I mean, you've seen me do this a million times, like, we oh, you're over projects. to go for a walk, but could you help me? Yeah. Could you read this to me? Could you change this light bulb? Like, I'm going to make a um, list. This is what we're doing. I love it. I love it. Or, I love it. or for your husband. Oh, like, yeah. My mom <laughs> makes the honey-do list for a your honey husband. The tall people. For her boyfriend. I need a tall person. <laughs> honey-do list. Um, yes, my mother's boyfriend is Jessica's husband, not in a physical <laughs> way. Uh, she just has a large. She just crush loves on him, him so and we much. Call him, her boyfriend. Yes. Yep. It's it's all yep. in good fun. I'm basically a um, lover. <laughs> she, she loves Jess, but she loves yeah, Chris. She loves Chris so much more. <laughs> so just utilizing all of those things, um, I do. One of my my bestest buddies in the whole world, um, Kristen, actually has power of attorney before this happened. Um, I did, you know, got all my legal documents in a row and it's a good thing that I did because she has power of attorney. So she, um, can talk to the doctors and the hospitals and fill out paperwork on my behalf. She can speak to USC HR and the disability mm -hmm. company that USC works with. So that's been really helpful as well because she has the ability to sign, sign off yeah. on okay. decisions and mm -hmm. she can pull a plug if she yeah. wants to. She wouldn't. No, she might. I can really ignore her. <laughs> I really irritate her. Really and, irritate her. And Kristen her. Uh, probably got there. Kristen is one of Marissa's high school friends. Junior high friends, too? No, actually, we met first day of kindergarten. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I don't we have think a picture. I have that old of a friend. We have That's a picture insane. on my mom's refrigerator. Next time you're at my mom's house, oh there's a God. picture of us, like, at our Christmas pageant. We have these big red bows, like, that say our name and glitter. And we're five. Oh my God. And we're standing there together. Oh, that's so, oh my God. I had no idea. Yeah. I was just yeah. like a girlfriend like Jenny. She is the OG. She oh is my gosh, the OG. She really is. Yeah. For she's sure. definitely like, I think I have more like a sister. Yeah, she is. I have a few other friends from elementary school. Um, and a handful, not really. My elementary school friends went, we went to middle school together as well. And then, high school. And then I actually don't have too many friends from my four years at SC, but post SC, mm -hmm. um, like our alumni group, I have yeah. a million friends from, I mean, I have that's a million great, friends from SC. Great but, <laughs> I'm an honorary yeah, member. That's, that's how Erica, <laughs> yeah, that's how, that's how I met Erica. And, that's and, the only reason that I know anybody in Southern Jen. California. <laughs> you. I have you. a lot of friends. Yeah. And that's a, that's a way that I, you know, I've, I've had to learn. So just like, ask for help. Um, especially driving, obviously I can't drive, sold my car. Um, and you know, like Autopia at Disneyland is probably like the most I'll ever drive <laughs> um, yeah. again, but yeah, just asking for help. It's been a learning curve. Yeah. So I guess that's like kind of like a perfect wrap up, um, kind of reaching the end of our first conversation. I'm sure there'll be a part de and a third. A a uh, a, a have, trace, like oh, trois? Maybe. Ooh. Ooh la la. Hey, baby. <laughs> Definitely going to have to put like, there's a few bad words in here. Oh yeah. I'm going to click the box that says explicitive or expletive. Not too explicit. I don't know there's a couple F-bombs. but a few. It's little less words. A few. F-bombs. But like kind of just all encompassing everything that we talked about. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Any advice that you'd like to give to listeners out there? Sure. Whether they're going through cancer yeah. or not. I mean, cancer sucks. Like just mm -hmm. don't get cancer. There you okay. go. That's oh, my advice. Awesome. 
Done. Thank you. <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, I might, you know, I would say if you have a child, if you have nieces and nephews, if you have grandchildren, you know, there's, everyone has children in their lives. Um, this is a pediatric disease, so you're not going to get it when you're 15. Mm -hmm. Um, but just pay attention to looking at photos and looking in your children's eye. I don't want to scare people because it is such a rare disease, but if you do see something that looks like a glow that kind of just looks like, sometimes it's like, it's like white and mm -hmm. opaque and just, Anything I'll, you I'll think, post a picture on, on my uh, yeah, website anything and my social media. You think looks different? Um, see a pediatric ophthalmologist. And, you know, if you have an HMO, you might need to go to your pediatrician first and then get referred out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, don't take no for an answer. If they, if they say, oh, there's nothing wrong, you need to see an actual an specialist, opinion. not just your pediatrician. Or, yeah. Yeah, you need, you need someone that deals with eyes. We have lots of resources at worldeyecancerhope.org. Um, you know, if you need to find a, a hospital, if you live in the middle of nowhere and you have no idea where to go, you mm -hmm. can reach out and, or, you know, we, we can't tell you where to go, but we can list yeah. a resource of hospitals mm -hmm. or connect you with other people that might live in, in your same area. Mm -hmm. So just be cognizant of, of looking at your child and that you know, applies to other senses too. If you, if you notice your child isn't responding to you when you talk to them, they might need to have a hearing check. You know, if they're running into things, they might have other vision issues. Just be responsible. And um, I guess wrap it up with, it's important to, you know, you have bad days. I had a terrible day yesterday. I totally snapped at my mom who was like, what time you want to go pick up avocados from Kristen's house? And I'm like, nah. you know, <laughs> she's literally like <laughs> talking about avocados and like, being bitchy to her for no reason. Yeah. Um, you know, life is short. You got to make the best of, of it. And I think being 20 months out of losing the vision, I am finally at that place where I can actually see, all right, this is the new normal. And mm -hmm. Might as well do something with it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, don't give up. And, you know, I'm not sitting here trying to just like take unemployment from the state. I'm working and doing my charity work. And that's all I know how to do. I'm not, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. And listeners, whoever listens to it, I thank you for sharing your story with us. And, and your outlook's amazing. Like you just taken a shit ton of lemons and made some lemonade. So um, thank you for sharing this, this whole story with us. And I look forward to having you on again. Um, Yay. Well, but, thank you for starting this podcast. I know you're, you're newly into the cancer I know, world here. I know. Just a couple well, months. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's been a blessing to have so many supportive people in my life. Like my cancer diagnosis was you know, at age 35. Like it's, it's something, you know, new. I haven't been dealing with this my whole life, but just to have a, a really great community around me, uh, friends, family, people who, who understand and, you know, gave me really good advice and, you know, just gave me a lot of love mm -hmm. and, you know, for, for everybody that I did tell, um, right away, like you, you like just getting that initial, like, hug you just grabbed me and hugged me and that that meant more to me than anything so um thank well, you well you waited until i threw away my dog's poop i know <laughs> i was i was literally poop putting poop in a trash can and you're like i'm just going to tell you and i don't like, know i don't know when to do this <laughs> how does one do that but i don't know maybe when you're just tossing dog poop it's a great yeah. time it seems that seems legit yeah so um shitty so yeah. oh, oh, shit was full <laughs> <laughs> oh, best movie. Fix the no post. Oh my gosh. I'll just probably throw that one. I know it's a Christmas movie, but <gasps> shit. We're just watching movies, <laughs> watching TV all the time. Might as well throw that one on. But thank you, Marissa. Thank you for coming on and popping Also, my, my other cherry. piece of advice oh, is go, go to Antarctica. Go to Antarctica. Oh, my other piece of advice is go to Antarctica. Okay. Yeah. Go, go play, yeah. visit the penguins. Marissa did yeah. that. Mm -hmm trip of a lifetime. So jealous. My, I'm sorry you went blind you. trip. <gasps> That's what it was. My mom was like, this sucks. Let's go to Antarctica. And I was like, no way. I can't afford this. Freaking Indiana like, Marty. Yeah. You guys are the most adventurous people. Basically have been everywhere. <laughs> We'd been in Egypt the year before. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I got Egypt and Antarctica in an 18 month That's window. Incredible. Yeah. 
If I can hike in Antarctica blind, I can do anything. Mm-hmm. There you go. There's your quote. I like it. I will. There you go. There's your quote. There you go. <laughs> I quote you on that. That's on the record. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop recording, but I'm going to keep okay. you on. But thank you so much, Marissa Gonzalez. I love you so much. And, thank you so much, uh, Jessica Thomas Nelson. I know. Um, but thank so you. So weird to call for, you Jessica Nelson. I know. It still sounds funny. I, I sometimes trip up every now and then, and Chris gets mad. I'm like, sorry. <laughs> or, you know, just Natasha just calls you guys far.